Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our session, The Game of Cyber Threat Hunting, The Return of the Fun. I'm ji from IBM Research. And today with my colleague, Xiao Kei, we will present our open source threat hunting language for simple, composable, and shareable hunter flows. In the movie, we often see threat hunters use various fancy tools like augmented reality navigation tools to easily have all the necessary data at their fingertips. And then they can simply focus on constructing and validating various threat hypotheses, which actually looks very fun. In reality, we do have a lot of advanced threat investigation and hunting tools, such as SIM security information and event management system, and EDR endpoint detection and response solution. But many different tools also come with many different manuals and API documentation to read and many different records to digest. So we ended up spending majority of our time on learning how to construct query and how to interpret the query results and then going through record by record to stitch observation from multiple tools, which often requires significant amount of manual work. So the gap between movie and reality shows there are two types of questions in threat hunting, what to hunt and how to hunt. We tend to spend more time on how to hunt, like how should I construct a query that I want to ask for this easier solution, or how should I interpret the query results and extract the field that I need, or how to connect multiple observations by reading through manuals and API documentation for each tool and building the custom script, script to change them. But at the same time, we do know that the core value of threat hunting comes from what to hunt, like constructing and validating new threat hypotheses or discovering the new insight using threat intelligence or the machine learning model. Then the question is, how can you make the threat hunting more fun and efficient? For that, we need to prioritize the hunting tasks such that we spend more time on thinking about stereotypic plots and threat hypotheses rather than learning how to use and integrate tools. That's why today we are going to introduce Castro, our open source threat hunting language, to shift the focus from how to hunt to what to hunt. Why a new language? Because threat hunters need a way to express the what. Think about describing control flows of a hunting program. Plus, the control flows can be modified on the fly regarding the dynamic nature of threat hunting. We need the description power that does not exist. We expect senior hunters to describe hunting steps and connect them into hunt flows. We expect hunt flows to be shared and re-executed. And we expect different ways of executing the language. That's half of the story, the top half about the what. As we relieve the users of the how, someone or something needs to take care of the how. We develop the Castro runtime to complete the mission. Castro runtime has three main interfaces, all of which can pass the what from the users deeply down the stack to figure out the how and execute. The runtime completes the how for the what and generate codes to be executed locally and remotely. When big rock for hunting, is data and information retrieval. We build on top of the open source project Stick Shifter to enable access to a variety of data sources and threat intelligence sources. We also take advantage of containers and serverless computing as a means to invoke external knowledge, proprietary knowledge, or complex logic into building hunt flows. Okay, so that hunters may get bored about these complex gray boxes in Castro runtime. No worry. The takeaway here is these boxes will do the how for you 
and provide you a logical data representation to help describe the what, in steps, and chain them into hunt flows. So what are the what? In the language design, we carefully abstract the what into two categories. First is patterns or graph patterns as our ultimate goal. A user can use a pattern to describe what he or she wants to take a close look. Some interesting processes, instances of TTPs, connected entities like child processes of a process, or any entity that has some relations or share some common information with what he or she already inspected. Patterns in Kestra are similar to regular expressions, but matched against structured computation logs, such as process trees from EDR systems or NetFlow records from firewalls. Patterns is about data retrieval. Hunters pipe one pattern after another to iteratively find the entities that belong to an attack. Sometimes that's not enough. So we give the hunters the second expression of what? The analytics. Castro has a modular foreign language interface to execute any external logic as analytics. Invoking external threat entail to calculate the suspiciousness of given processes, determining the likelihood of data exfiltration on given network traffic, or draw the data on the canvas in an interactive hunt. You can think about analytics as serverless computing functions running in the cloud, but obey the rules Castro define for input and output. Now, Threat Hunter has two powerful means to express the what in their mind. And they need to do one more thing to make a hunt. Compose a hunt flow with patterns and analytics. We like things simple. We like things powerful. We want both. Yes, it's possible. With the idea composability from functional programming. A thread hunter not only can chain different patterns, but also analytics after pattern, analytics after analytics, pattern after analytics. An example here, a hunter first uses a pattern to match a list of processes he is interested, which access ETC shadow and spawn a share. Then he pipes it to an analytics that invokes external thread intel to rank the matched processes from the pattern. We can describe the pattern in a graph and execute the analytics in a Docker container. That's our first simple hunt flow. We can extend it to have a pattern before our old one. So the worker process in the second pattern is not matched against any processes on the host, but against a list of pre-matched processes from the first pattern. Of course, we can pipe an outlier detection analytics after our first analytics. Besides adding more, threat hunting is an interactive procedure. It is common for hunters to manipulate the hunt flow, replace the second analytics with a machine learning model, merge multiple flows into one, or fork a hunt flow branch to verify a different version of the threat hypothesis. We expand what are the what. We expand what is the composability. What's the secret sauce to make hunt flow composable from any pattern or analytics? The magic is a logical data representation human naturally use, entities. A host is an entity, a network traffic is an entity, a process is an entity, a user is an entity. Okay, you get it. Before we work with entities in Kestra, threat hunters directly work with raw logs, records, or observations generated by monitoring systems. 
the diverse formats and semantics of these raw records contributes largely to the time threat hunters spend on the how. A fundamental idea of Castro is for the wrong time to assemble records into entities and enforce the input and output of any pattern or analytics to be a homogeneous list of entities. Then we have entity-based cyber reasoning. Let's search for TTP pattern with three entities, a Node.js process, a worker process, and a binary. Can we get the worker process entities that are forked from a Node.js but has a different executable associated? That's an exploited process. That's easy. Can we get child process entities of the processes in the worker? Easy. Can we load a list of IP addresses into the variable sense host as host entities? Yes. Can we search for any process forked from share and connected to any sense host? Sure. Can we even get process entities from another endpoint that connects to any exploited process in eWorker? We can. Lastly, can we trace back to the root cause of this attack? Here it is. Finally, can we get other type of entities like files in a Kestra wearable? Can we apply uh, analytics on a Kestra wearable? Can we search for entities from different sensors, EDRs, NDRs, firewalls, same systems? Yes, yes, and yes. Next, let's see the enabler of heterogeneous data source queries. At this moment, you may start wondering how it is possible for Castro to operate across multiple data sources. For the purpose, we embrace STIX, Structure Thread Information Expression. STIX is an open standard maintained by OASIS, Cyber, Cyber Threat Intelligence Technical Committee. And STIX is to use Exchange Cyber Threat Intelligence. And STIX patterning is a patterning language supporting six indicators with which set of operators to match patterns. We leverage six in Castro for two reasons. First, we strongly believe an open standard can facilitate information sharing across multiple organizations to protect against ever evolving cyber threats together. Second, our entity-based reasoning fits well with six graph-based models which can connect various heterogeneous observables with their relationship. Stick Shifter is an open source project hosted by Open Cyber Security Alliance, OCA, to enable universal data access while data stays where it is. For example, as shown on the right-hand side, a single stick patterning can be translated into multiple native queries through various stick shifter connectors to communicate with multiple different data sources, for example, EDR, SIM, and data lake. And then the core results are written as six observations in JSON format. So in other words, six shift provides a standard way to integrate with multiple products. And as you can see on this chart, six shift supports many different data sources today, and it continuously evolves with open source community. Next, we'll demonstrate how we can actually do the threat hunting with Castro hunting language to discover data breach started by a sphere facing email. During the demonstration, as a threat hunter, we would not know anything about the entire attack plot. Instead, we simply have to rely on observations at a few vantage points to discover the whole attack, like real time host and network based the rebel monitoring solution, which you might already use in your day-to-day -day job. For example, we use the Sysmon for monitoring a Windows machine, and we use open source system telemetry called Sysflow for monitoring a server. And Squid Web Proxy was used to monitor the web traffic. 
And then these logs are invested into Elasticsearch and SIM, which we are going to utilize and correlate using Castro. Okay, then let's dive into threat hunting with Castro. Hello, this is Xiao Kui. In this demo, I am a threat hunter searching for attacks like this ones. Recently, I get a new client, StarX, who finds me to do a hunt in their enterprise network to discover advanced threats beyond what firewalls and IDS can detect. Okay, let's start. So I usually use Jupyter Notebook to do hunting and let's create our first orchestra hunt flow for StarX. And we can um, give it um, a name. And before we start, um, we need to understand the target, StarX, their assets, their services, their monitors, so we know what to ask in a hunt. For this purpose, I get their topology so that we can take a look. Um, okay, and we can mark put it into a markdown and display that. Okay, so Star X has two private networks, one for their employees' laptops and workstations, one for their servers. All servers are Linux, and they have Sysflow running on all of the servers, which are monitors that we can ask for real-time data. What's happening there? So the company has security in mind. So they have web proxy that uh, um, audit and logs all HTTP and HTTPS traffic before they hit the internet. And they put their sensitive data, commercial secrets in a network storage and has limited access to it, uh, only give it access to specific servers and, and uh, users. Okay. So um, where to start? Um, we can start from one of the um, we can start from one of the um, servers, the first the server 31, and we can start with my favorite TTP, the web service exploit. So as I explained earlier, um, in the slides, this web service exploit is something that um, we can match instance um, that shows this is a new process forked from a web service, but not actually the web service. So we can say, um, we use a six shifter to access the data, um, Linux server uh, 31, and we need to use this pattern, um, parent ref uh, to describe the, the TDP pattern, so that process binary ref dot name not equals node. So this is basically um, what this pattern is, and we want to find this process is, if it exists. So to make the search um, faster, we do not want to hit the server of months of data. We want to restrict it, for example, for a day. Today is April 5th, and let's do April 5th. Usually, a day's data is about 10 gigabytes from Sysflow, and, uh, oh, that's, that's pretty quick, okay. So we get back over 100 records. Do not worry. So records are not entities. Records are raw data that we get back. A cache will process that for you so that um, you can ask it for entity information. Um, so name, PID, command line. Um, actually, there's only one entity here. Even we get so many records back that this single entity has a single PID with two names. The reason for it is this is how Linux handle process creation. It has two system calls. Um, so this is the final one that, um, um, that will do a netcat um, connect to a compromised server and uh, fork a bash. No, change to a bash. So let's see if we find something like this. Um, created by um, um, name PIDM command line. So that um, if we are lucky, and if a no, no, if attacker is lucky to get in and uh, establish it, establish it successfully, we will see that. Uh, a netcat process forked from it, and then that one will change itself to a bash um, according to this um, command. What does this mean? Okay, we get it. Yeah, really, we get two some record back, but actually this, the records are associated with three um, entities, or just one entity actually, with one single PID. As we said, this is a parent, this is a forked, and this is a final process. Okay, 
So this is actually turned into a bash. When attacker comes in and connects through a bash, what will he do? So let's see, find process created by um, Mapcat and uh, let's display um, name, PID, and uh, command line as usual. Um, okay, so this will give you an idea um, about what activities that a hacker did um, after getting in and fork a bash into the system. Okay, the netcan and bash are actually the same one as you can see, the PID is the same. So, um, okay, okay, that's not too slow. <laughs> Uh, we get many, many uh, things that attacker did, okay? Um, too many of them. So which one is more important than the others so that we can, uh, we can further drill down? We need to ask, get some intelligence. Um, if there is something that can sort it by the suspiciousness, that will be very useful, okay? Here we introduce our first um, uh, analytics that we can run analytics as Docker containers, as I previously said, uh, suspicious process scoring. So this is the one um, that uh, we can run, and uh, we can also show some of the suspicious things. Um, not only the command line, um, but also a new uh, attributes that generated by these. Um, analytics. So these analytics actually use Sigma rules and some of the other kind of knowledge to understand uh, how suspicious a process is. Okay, I said we need to rank it. Okay, uh, and we can sort suspicious p by um, so that we um, replace the original variable with uh, the same name variable uh, with a sorted result and and show it. Okay. Then this is the most suspicious process that we can drill down f next. So looks like this is something related to Twitter, maybe some network traffic. So let's match it and also see whether there's any network traffic from it. So that um, what we can do is to match anything from, not from a data source, but from a previous variable that we have, or all the activities, and get a Twitter um, uh, process, and then try to see whether there's any narrow traffic. We get five distinct narrow traffic flows from it. So most of them connect to, this is uh, the one that we are inspecting the, the, the source. And most of them connecting to this one, the, actually this is the web proxy. So that means we do not get a real destination. Mm. If we want to get a real destination, we need to ask the other half of the proxy traffic from the um, from the, the, the web proxy. So what we can do is, um, so this time um, we ask um, web proxy, which is, which has, uh, which a curator is running there and get all the logs from there. We can ask a curator box, uh, which is the commercial SIM system. Um, and then we can ask all the narrow traffic from it that matches the criteria we give. What is the criteria? That is, that has the IP address of the source IP address, source port, and, and as well, Castro will derive a timestamp from our previous traffic. So that actually it's a three tuple, the source IP, source port, and timestamp that will uniquely identify this traffic so that we get the second half of the traffic going out. We get a real destination IP address. So this one seems to be familiar. Okay, this is narrow storage uh, sensitive data here. We still don't know what are the other narrow traffic IP addresses. Hmm. We can do some of the uh, kind of uh, um, IP address enrichment. Yes, we can. We can apply the second analytics here to help us do that. That's the destination IP enrichment. So, um, and then we can display the, um, the information um, there. Basically, this is uh, analytics that's run live in a Docker container to reach out to his services to get the uh, uh, domain name and corporation back. So that we see that um, not only this internal sandy one, it's also, also reach out to some of the external Twitter IP and Cloudflare. This looks like a data exfiltration. Are we sure? 
So we can get some other help from the um, one of the uh, data extraction model that I built um, within the last couple of weeks that um, digest the normal traffic from star X about so which server usually split which type of traffic to which IP addresses and try to decide whether this is something um, suspicious uh, look like an exfiltration or not. This is the third um, analytics we can run. So as you see, I piped the second analytics on top of the first one so that we can show the IP address with what we get from the first analytics and what we get from the second analytics. As it shows here, um, this is a highly likely a data exfiltration to this IP address given the model that um, um, built through the last couple of weeks. And okay, then th that's pretty good that uh, we have a very easy hunt, get some of the very useful information, but one question we still do not understand where the, the, the attacker is coming from. Okay, so we know that this is exploit and can we get that incoming traffic from this exploit, uh, exploited uh, kind of uh, um, process. We can find network traffic um, created by this um, process. We found zero network traffic. Okay, that is because this one is actually the, the forked process and actually the Node.js main process handles network traffic. What we can do is um, we can find, try to find the, the, um, the parent process of this one and then to find our traffic from there so that um, we can try to find and display our traffic from the parent process of this expired one. Okay, we get that. This is a destination IP, which is our current investigating um, server. And this is the source. Oh, it's coming from internal um, insider threads here. One of the employees' laptop. Fortunately, we have Sysmon six, six running there so that we can ask the server for more details about what happened within the, the uh, not server, the laptop. So this is the narrow traffic that views from the, um, the server side, but we can also have the same narrow traffic but viewed from the Windows laptop side so that we can do um, what we did similarly for the curator that we try to match network traffic from um, a Windows laptop one for one, um, and then um, we match it from their uh, uh, destination uh, IP address and source port, as well as the timestamp that will be automatically derived. So we get the same network traffic, but this time we get that from the Windows laptop. So let's see which process get that. Um, created DNT display um, P uh, R name command line. Okay, let's get some of the basic idea what happens. Ah, there is a PowerShell um, uh, script waxing availability of JPEG that that causes this traffic and and uh, penetrate into the server. So, what's really um, is uh, a parent process. Um, let's see. And the parent process of the PowerShell is a email client. Okay. Um, that looks like this is something. Um, um, like uh, spam um, and uh, the, the user just uh, um, created by, sorry, that's here. I, I try to match um, the, the chart process of the PowerShell to see what else the attacker did. Okay, a lot of pings and uh, then um, open a JPEG. Okay, that's expected. So that Basically, currently we have a, a, a good idea what happens um, for the attack. So let's write a summary and about the attack. And um, the source of the attack happens when um, there was a phishing email going into the email clients that was clicked by the employee 
on this machine. And uh, the PowerShell script um, penetrates into another server, vulnerable server, and then has the CNC established and extracted data out through Twitter. That's all about the attack. That's good. Thank you for watching. Um, this is the entire hunt. Okay, as we just demonstrated with Castor hunting language, you can easily connect and correlate with your multiple data sources and start building your own hunting pattern. And you can even share your advanced hunting analytics with open source community. And you can also learn from more experienced red hunters by adapting the hunter flows. And we'll share more detailed information about how to start using our open source Castro during the Q&A session. We would like to close by thanking everyone who has supported and contributed to Castro. And thank you for listening to our talk. And we are happy to take any questions. Thank you.